All right, welcome everybody to the November 2nd special election training. My name is Steve Gerhardt. I'm the Chief Deputy City Clerk for the City of Ann Arbor. All of you should know me by now, but I do appreciate all of you uh, agreeing to work this November 2nd special election. So for this election, the precincts are consolidated. So what that means is we typically have 53 precincts open. Uh, so instead of having uh, polling locations where we would typically run two precincts within one location, each of those locations are now just consolidated down into one uh, precinct. So precincts such as uh, 1-1 and 112 at Michigan Union, where we had two since we're expecting light turnout. And uh, it's an off-year election where we are able to do it. Uh, they are getting consolidated down to just the one precinct. Uh, so we'll only have 38 of our 53 precincts open. Each precinct will be staffed with five, uh, five to seven workers, just because uh, this is our first real uh, off year election since we've implemented uh, proposal three. So we're not quite sure yet what to expect in terms of voter turnout. We saw last November with the presidential election, uh, over 85% of voters cast their ballot by an absentee ballot prior to the election. We don't know if that trend is going to continue or if that was just a uh, being in the true throes of the pandemic when with everybody pushing, vote early, don't risk standing in line. Is that going to continue? Will people be interested in this election? Um, what I can tell you is in terms of the number of absentee ballots that we've mailed for this election, our number of absentee ballots that we've mailed uh, exceeds what we mailed for the 2016 presidential election. Uh, and if all those are returned, then we would be at a record turnout for a off year uh, or uh, odd year election, considering we only have uh, four charter amendments on the election, that would be record turnout for something like that. By now, you all should have received your official appointment emails. Uh, they were sent out on October 13th. So if for some reason you have not received that email, letting you know which uh, precinct to report to on November 2nd, please do send me an email to the recruiters at a2gov email after uh, this training so I can look into what happened there and resend it to you if need be. So what is on this ballot? Uh, we do have four charter amendments. The first one is an Ann Arbor City Charter Amendment related to best value purchasing. Basically, it's amending the city charter. Uh, Currently, the city is required to award contracts to the lowest bidder, and this would just amend the charter to allow the contract to be awarded to what the city deems to be the best bidder. And you could look at a number of uh, features uh, in the contract that would ultimately be decided. The second is a charter amendment related to ranked choice voting for mayor and city council. Ultimately, once this is allowable under state law and the um, city has the voting equipment that is capable of doing this, the mayor and council races would be switched to ranked choice voting where rather than just voting for one candidate, uh, individuals voting would go ahead and uh, rank their candidate. Uh, choices for candidates, basically one, two, three, four. This is the order in which I choose my candidates. The third one is a charter amendment related to emergency procurement. Currently, uh, the city doesn't have a process in the charter by which the city administration can make an emergency purchase. So this would just allow that. And finally, uh, the last charter amendment is related to the threshold by which uh, city departments have to go to city council for purchases. Currently, any purchase over $25,000 uh, 
uh, department has to go before city council for approval. This would raise that threshold to $75,000 and also it would allow a city council to adjust this threshold uh, based on inflation. So those are the four uh, charter amendments. On election day, if anybody has questions on these four charter amendments, uh, they can call our office and we can provide them with additional information. You in the precinct cannot provide the additional information. That would be up to our office to do so. So arriving at the precinct on election day, election inspectors must arrive at the precinct at 6 a.m. on election day. Make sure to have your cell phone on and set to ring when you get to the precinct. Uh, we do have a good number of election inspectors that have already signed up to receive the cell phone stipend. We provide that additional uh, little bit of money in exchange for you to uh, call us or allow us to call you on election day. Uh, if you don't know if you receive that or you know that you don't receive that, you can go ahead. The form is available on the city's website and we will go ahead uh, you can email that to me and I can get you signed up for that for all future elections once. You only have to submit it once and it's good for each election moving forward. So again, that forms on the city's website under the clerk's page, election inspectors, which is also where you'll find all the resources for you as election inspectors. Uh, chair people will arrive with the uh, e-poll book and the zipper notebooks. Again, for any chair people on this meeting, uh, the chairperson meeting is next Tuesday evening. Uh, once again, when I send out the link to that training, we'll be sending out a link for a sign up genius where you'll have a chance to pick up, uh, pick up or sign up for your time to pick up the uh, laptop on that Monday prior to the election. And at that same time that you're picking up the laptop, you'll also pick up your zippered notebook. Keep in mind when you're setting up the precinct starting at 6 a.m., the doors do need to be unlocked because anybody interested in observing the process does have the right to do so. Uh, the chairperson in the precinct will start the day by administering the oath to all the election inspectors. Uh, chair people will already have been uh, had the oath administered to them at the meeting, so they'll just need to sign that they've uh, been administered the oath but uh, election inspectors will need to be uh, sworn at and take the oath that morning. So health and safety, each precinct will be provided with hand sanitizers, gloves, masks, uh, hand sanitizer, or the sanitizer solution, so uh, Clorox wipes. Uh, one note, the only difference from November, uh, is that we're not going to be providing the individual, uh, basically flexible plexiglass face shields just due to their limited usage by election inspectors in November. Um, if there are any election inspectors that really would like one, if they can email me uh, separately, we can provide them in their boxes uh, for their precinct, but uh, we just, from being in the precincts, we noticed that there was not usage of those. I will note that if anybody does want them, uh, please note that it does not replace the need to wear a mask. Uh, masks are mandatory for all election inspectors for this uh, election. When using your hand sanitizer, I do note that it is a little bit runny, so please make sure your hands are completely dry after using the hand sanitizer before touching a ballot or the e-poll book. So, you know, wait the full 20 seconds, uh, you know, hum the happy birthday song twice in your head. While we aren't providing the individual face shields, you will still have the large, tall plexiglass sneeze guards to place between workers at the e-poll book, uh, the ballot station and the application to vote spindles. So all the high traffic, uh, spots where you actually will be interacting with voters will still have the um, like four foot tall plexiglass shields so that 
you'll have that barrier in between you and the voter. Sample precinct is still the uh, sample layout is still the same, making sure that you leave plenty of space uh, for social distancing. Again, you'll have large enough space and the turnout will be low enough that there shouldn't be any reason not to um, have plenty of room for social distancing. Also keep in mind, uh, leaving doors open just to promote, uh, promote good ventilation. While voters are strongly encouraged to wear a mask and you can give extra mask to voters, uh, you cannot deny a ballot to a person should they not be wearing a mask. I, again, we did not really see any issues with this in November, keep in mind, that the vaccination rate in the county is extremely high. I believe we're up around 75, 80% countywide. So really shouldn't have too many concerns uh, in the city. Uh, election inspectors, poll watchers, and challengers are required to wear a mask in the precinct. Just voters aren't required to wear a mask. Election inspectors, you are required as city workers. As city workers, we have a mask mandate in place currently. Uh, so that's your requirement as well as a city worker for the day. I do take frequent breaks during the course of the day to wash your hands with soap and water uh, for at least 20 seconds. Again, it should be a slow enough day that you'll have plenty of breaks to take, or plenty of opportunities to take those breaks to wash your hands. Uh, practice good cleanliness. Uh, so sanitation protocol, uh, again, you'll have the baskets for clean and dirty pens, so that way you can keep track of them and wipe them down in batches with Clorox wipes. The voting booths, wipe them down after every voter. Uh, the tabulator touch screens, you can wipe them down with alcohol wipes after every voter that touches the screen. Keeping in mind that uh, the voter shouldn't be touching the touch screen very often. The only time the touch screen, touch screen is touched is should they be rejecting the ballot. So in the case of an overvote or um, which would be the only instance this time, which with just the four yes, no proposals, there really shouldn't be too many overvotes for this election. Uh, same with the voter assist terminal after every user, just go ahead and wipe it down with the alcohol pipe, uh, wipes. Uh, e poll book laptop, again, wiping it down with the alcohol wipes between each user. Uh, in your hands, uh, either uh, using hand sanitizer, or if you do choose to wear gloves, make sure that you uh, use hand sanitizer or wash your hands uh, after you exchange the gloves. So e poll book setup, um, check to make sure that you do have the correct laptop. Keep in mind that if you are in a consolidated precinct, say you're in 4757, the laptop that you're going to have is going to be the laptop for the first precinct. So it's going to be the laptop for 47. So when you open it up, uh, you're just going to see the sticker for the one of them but it is going to be the location that you're in. So that's going to be the one easy way to see. So you're gonna see that it is four seven, but it's still going to say Dickens School. And that's obviously going to be the school that you're sitting in. Uh, the one exception uh, that this is going to be is uh, three six and three nine. When you open your laptop, it's going to say Scarlet, uh, but unfortunately due to construction at Scarlet, school three six and three nine have had to move across the parking lot to mitchell so when they open it up up there's it'll say scarlet but they'll be sitting in mitchell but otherwise uh, the label on your laptop will match the school or location that you're sitting in the laptop really is the most important thing uh, when setting up the flow of your precinct because it kind of dictates the rest of the room location. So you wanna make sure that you position it next to a functioning outlet. There's nothing worse than getting the layout of your room set up only to realize that your laptop's not actually charging. So you always wanna take a peek in the lower right-hand corner of the screen and just make sure that it's receiving a charge. 
From there, you'll plug it, power it on and plug in the mouse and card reader. Um, make sure the laptop is fully booted up before plugging in the flash drive. Again, the flash drive gets plugged in to the laptop that has the arrow or into the USB drive with the um, arrow pointing to it. Keep in mind that last year we did switch the USB flash drives that we use for our precincts. They no longer require you to enter an encryption password. Instead, they're automatically paired to your laptop. So what that means is the second that you plug that flash drive in, it knows that that is the computer that it belongs to and it automatically unlocks with it and it's ready for you to save things in it. The computer knows to uh, default to saving things on uh, that USB drive. So it takes away a lot of the confusion and a lot of um, the concerns that we've had in the past of making sure that we are saving things in the right space. Um, and it's also one less password that you have to be concerned about on election day. And it's also uh, one less security risk that we have to be concerned about because if anybody does happen to walk away uh, with a USB drive, which we've never seen happen before, but if someone did, um, because you don't have the passwords in the precinct, uh, it would be essentially worthless to them because they don't have the password easily accessible in the precinct to grab. So therefore it's just an added layer of security by not having it, but it is still secure and everything is being saved into that secure flash drive. Another security feature of the election is we test every piece of equipment prior to the election to make sure that it is in proper working order. And once we do that, we verify and the, or we record the serial number and the seal numbers, uh, both here at City Hall, as well as in the cover of your uh, poll book. So you'll wanna check the cover of your poll book against your equipment to make sure that that all those numbers match up and that nothing's been tampered with. And the easiest way to do this is on your tabulator, the lid of the tabulator has a metallic seal on it. And on that seal right above the little barcode is the serial number. Once you open up the lid of that tabulator and you dock the screen and everything's in position, you'll see there's a blue uh, pull tight seal that says state of Michigan and there's a number underneath it. That is your seal number. And again, you'll just record those two numbers or you'll make sure those two numbers match with what's recorded on the cover of your paper poll book. So that way we know that from the time we test it and made sure everything was in working order, that everything's nobody's tampered with the programming inside. Again, it's very important that you don't cut that seal until the very end of the night. That way we can, you know, if we look during the course of the day, we know that nobody's been able to tamper with the USB stick inside. It's the exact same with the voter assist terminal or the VAT. Again, you'll compare that seal and serial number. That serial number, again, is on that metallic sticker uh, on the lid of it. And that seal number is that blue uh, pull tight seal that says State of Michigan. Again, do not cut the seal numbers off until the very end of the night. Uh, You'll see in the lower picture that there's the printer for both the um, tabulator and the voter assist terminal. For the voter assist terminal, once it prints its report, you can go ahead and tear that off and put it in its return to clerk's office once everybody signs. The zero tape that prints for the tabulator in the morning 
once that prints and you verify that, yep, there really is zero ballots cast for each of the um, different proposals, every election inspector will go ahead and sign that. But since we want to make sure that that you know we have our zero tape and then at the end of the night we have our totals tapes and we have a uncut you know line of transmission showing we started with zero we ended with how many ever votes we got you'll want to go ahead and roll that up so that way nobody walks off with a receipt and in that picture you see there's a little indent here and if you lift that up you can lift the tape up roll it out drop it back in and that way it's out of sight out of mind and nobody walks off with that tape The other important thing with the black ballot box is to verify that both the main ballot box and the auxiliary bin are empty first thing in the morning. Uh, so you just open it up using the black uh, key to make sure that there's no ballots inside. There shouldn't be for any reason, but again, it's just a double check to make sure that really we're starting with a fresh clean uh, election and we know that we're starting uh, in a good place. The auxiliary bin is the gray nylon pouch accessible from the rear of the ballot container. Again, you just use that black key to drop the uh, black half door at the back, uh, and then you can just stick your hand inside to make sure there's nothing inside. Again, the auxiliary bin is used just in case of uh, tabulator failure during the course of the day. If for some reason your tabulator was to go down, uh, rather than having voters stand in line uh, with their voted ballot until we could uh, either repair or get a new tabulator out to you. What the auxiliary bin allows you to do is there's a slot on the top of your tabulator or of your ballot box uh, where voters could just insert their voted ballot without the stub on it. And Ultimately, at the end of the night, once we got a working tabulator back out to you, uh, two election inspectors of opposite political parties would go ahead, take those ballots out of the gray bin, and then they would go ahead and insert them through the tabulator. It just keeps those ballots separate until such time that they can be tab tabulated. Uh, the election line tracker website, again, we'll be sending uh, this link to this line tracker uh, along with any other important uh, notes out to you the night prior to the election. So do check your email one last time that evening prior to the election, just because we do like to send you uh, one last uh, important email the night before, and it will include this. Uh, this website will be password protected just so that way uh, we don't have to worry about anybody uh, dumping any nefarious uh, data into the website and potentially causing uh, people to be dissuaded from voting by thinking that there's you know 500 people in line at logan elementary school uh, we also uh, the clerk's office and IT do occasionally uh, go through and look at the numbers just to make sure that uh, nothing seems to be very um, out of what would be expected for an election. And I'm sure some of you have had us call you to make sure that your numbers are really what we uh, or are what you are reporting. Oftentimes, what we find with the line tracker application is that uh, election inspectors are inputting the total number of voters according to the tabulator into the line tracker application uh, rather than the total number of people that are standing in line. What, this what we're really looking to do is get the number of people that are standing in line so that way people can try to gauge how long coming into the precinct would take them to vote. Uh, we don't really, while we care how many people have already voted, this isn't what we want reported on this website. Uh, the other nice feature 
of this website is uh, in the upper right hand corner, you do have the ability to report a problem. Again, this is for uh, non time sensitive. Again, these problems do come in directly to the clerk's website or our internal website for you. Um, but because we can't communicate directly back out to you, um, there's a little bit less of a satisfaction of knowing, hey, my problem's been addressed. So this is for less time sensitive things such as, hey, I'm starting to run low on like I voted stickers or, hey, Tommy didn't show up this morning, but we're gonna be perfectly fine without him. Uh, it's for things like that. It's not for urgent things such as we're trying to look up a voter to see if they voted absentee or not. Those are type of things are still phone calls to the clerk's office. So keep in mind, this is for less urgent phone calls. We do ask that you update the line at least once an hour. Uh, if not more, again, it should be a slow enough election that you can update you know, every 15, 30 minutes or so for this election. So again, uh, for this election, you know, just type in how many people are standing in line and hit submit count. Uh, for the voter side, it does take your numerical number of people that are standing in line and it converts it into a time estimate of how many minutes a person can expect to stand in line based on uh, if you're a dual e-poll book location and some other factors, it'll convert that into a time estimate. The website also uh, provides individuals with a nice map of where their precinct is located. Uh, so it is a nice uh, tool for the public to go ahead and see and help plan their day on election day, which is why it's very important that you go ahead and provide us with this information on election day. So every voter must complete an application to vote and present a ballot photo ID or sign an affidavit that they do not have photo ID before being issued a ballot. Acceptable photo ID must be a current with the exception of a Michigan driver's license or state ID. Acceptable photo ID includes a driver's license or personal identification card from any state. A federal or, federal or state governmental issued ID, a US passport or passport card, a student ID from a high school, college, or university. So, University of Michigan students can use their M cards, a military ID card, or a tribal identification card. So, one thing to keep in mind when uh, a voter comes in, if they don't have photo identification, it's really not that big of a deal. They simply just fill out the affidavit on the back where they print their name and they sign where they attest under penalty of perjury that they don't have photo ID and that they're wishing to vote. And then you as an election inspector write the date of the election and sign as well. Keep in mind, um, not having photo identification doesn't mean that I really don't have photo identification at all. It could be as simple as I walked up to the precinct because it was a beautiful fall day and that I left my wallet at home. Um, but what it doesn't mean is that I have photo identification in my pocket and that I'm just refusing to show it to you and that I've let you know that it's in my pocket and that I'm refusing to show it to you. If I let you know that I have it on me, well, then I'm ineligible to sign this affidavit because I'm in possession of photo identification. And until I show you my photo identification, I cannot be issued a ballot. So just a little distinction there. So working at the e-poll book, uh, you work in pairs, one person at the e-poll book itself and the person next to them at the stack of ballots. Uh, the person at the e-poll book will compare the information on the application to vote with the information in the e-poll book, looking at the voter's name, address, and date of birth, just to make sure that they have the correct voter. 
Uh, you're going to look at the voter's uh, photo identification just to make sure the name and their photo matches the person standing in front of you. Again, keep in mind that with a Michigan driver's license or state ID, the photo could be up to eight years old and a lot of a, a person's appearance can change in eight years. So it's important that uh, you do provide a little bit of leniency, but there are some things that don't change in the course of eight years. Uh, a person's eyes and kind of like their nose appearance uh, without uh, cosmetic surgery aren't going to really change. So you're looking for like the eyes, nose, brow area, those type of things don't typically change. And those also things are things that wouldn't require you to have somebody remove their mask to be able to tell if it's them uh, when checking their, I, uh, their ID. You're gonna check to see if there's a red question mark uh, next to the voter's name. And if there is a red question mark, you have a wonderful uh, one page guide in your uh, election inspector manual to assist you with that. In terms of the election inspector manual, if you have an election inspector manual that is dated anything other than August of 2020, uh, we do have new election inspector manuals available. Those election inspector manuals are available from the city clerk's office uh, anytime during business hours. We're open Monday through Friday, eight to five, just close noon to one for lunch. Uh, we'll also be open uh, the Saturday prior to the election from eight to four for you to come in and pick one up, which is uh, October 30th. And that day will just be open the straight eight to four o'clock. So you can come in and pick one up. Uh, also a paper copy of the ele uh, election inspector manual will be in your zippered notebook and a digital copy of it uh, will be on the ePollbook laptop. So assuming that there isn't a, a red question mark or you've taken care of the red question mark, you're gonna, you're gonna go ahead and issue the ballot in the ePoll book. When you issue the ballot in the ePoll book, it's going to go ahead and uh, tell you the voter number. And after the first voter of the day, it's gonna also tell you the ballot number. So that makes your life easy. So you'll just, uh, go ahead and tell the person sitting next to you at the number or at the ballots. That person sitting next to you at the ballots is going to record that voter number and ballot number on the application and vote. They're going to verify that that ballot number really is the next available ballot by looking at the ballot stub. They're going to hand the voter their ballot in a secrecy sleeve along with that completed application to vote that now has the voter number, the ballot number, and the uh, initials saying that they've issued them their ballot. If for some reason they have to prepare a challenge ballot, they would be the ones that do it. And we'll get into what it means to prepare a challenge ballot later on in the process. And they're also going to provide uh, brief verbal instructions on marking the ballot, which simply means that they're going to tell the voter uh, to complete their choices by filling in the box next to their choice uh, completely. It's important when working at the ballots that they pre-fill in the secrecy sleeves ahead of time in groups to 20 or 30 to make sure that a voter isn't accidentally issued two ballots. Uh, hopefully in November, we're not dealing with too much humidity, which is often what causes ballots to stick together. But you just want to go through and check to make sure, hey, I have ballots three, four, and six. Where's ballot number five? Oh, it accidentally stuck to the back of number four. Because I went through and I pre-filled in my secrecy sleeves ahead of time, I was able to catch that without, uh, you know, the fourth person coming in and getting two ballots. So keep in mind, Proposal 3 did make changes to voter registration. We no longer have the 30-day close of registration. Any voter who wishes to register to vote 
uh, can do so up until 8 p.m. on election day. They have to come to our office to register. When they come into our office, they have to have proof of residency in order to register, which could be a Michigan driver's license or personal identification card listing their current Ann Arbor address. Or they need photo identification along with a utility bill, a pay stub, bank statement, governmental form, or letter. Uh, these documents can be shown to our office electronically. So it could be like I had my DTE bill uh, on my phone. That's perfectly acceptable. Uh, once we register them to vote in our office, they'll be given the option of either voting an absentee ballot at the clerk's office or uh, returning to the precinct. Uh, if they do return to your office or return to you in the precinct, they'll be given a receipt uh, so that you can add them to your unlisted tab in the e-poll book. What I can tell you is now that we've had a few elections of this, uh, about 99.5% of voters are just going to take the option of voting right here in our office using an absentee ballot. Uh, typically, if we do have any voters that are coming back out to the precinct to vote, uh, it's because it's their first time voting and uh, either they're super excited about doing it or uh, mom and dad are super excited uh, that that's their first time voting in the precinct and they want that experience. Uh, so it's, it's very rare that somebody that's coming in to register to vote on election day uh, is gonna be coming back out to the precinct. But again, if they do have to come back out to the precinct, uh, they will be given one of these voter registration receipts. Anybody that registers within the last 14 days prior to the election, so after October 19th, will be given one of these voter registration receipts. Um, anybody that registers after 4 p.m. on November 1st, so that Monday prior to the election, will need to be added to the unlisted tab because they won't automatically appear in your e-poll book. Anything prior to that will automatically be in your e-poll book, so you would just look them up like any other regular voter. These receipts will indicate whether they need to be issued a regular or a challenged ballot. Um, the majority of these voters that are registering in the last 14 days are issued challenged ballots uh, simply because Michigan state law requires anybody that registers uh, with something other than a Michigan driver's license or state ID listing their current address to be issued a challenged ballot. And if they are being issued a challenge ballot, the directions for preparing the challenge ballot are right on this receipt. The form does include a uh, does include a application to vote. However, it is easier for them to just fill out a new uh, application to vote as you would have to cut this form out and basically do arts and crafts by punching holes in it. So it's easier to just have them fill out a new application. Keep in mind, the other big change with proposal three is basically nobody um, is just completely out of luck when it comes to registering to vote or being turned away. There's always options. And in terms of assisting you with those options, we created this flow chart to assist you in the precinct, uh, helping them decide what their next uh, best move is. So if you have a voter and you can't find them in uh, your precinct, you've checked the other tab to see if they just are registered in a different precinct. You've tried every other variation of their name possibly to see if it was misspelled. You've called our office. You can always use this flowchart. Uh, we do ask that you actually work through this flowchart with the voter. That way you can send it to uh, the precinct or back to our office. Uh, but it is a, uh, it is in your zipper notebook and it is useful in assisting voters and making sure that nobody is uh, disenfranchised on election day. So at the e-poll book, uh, when they're handed their ballot, they'll be handed their ballot along with their application to vote that's been completed. 
the voter will go into the voting booth and they'll cast their ballot in privacy. Once they're done marking their ballot, they'll bring their ballot in their ballot secrecy sleeve to the person stationed uh, 10 feet away from the tabulator. What that person 10 feet away from the tabulator is going to do is uh, take the application to vote from them, look on that application to vote to see what ballot number they were issued and compare that ballot number to the stub of their ballot in the secrecy sleeve, just to make sure that the numbers still match up uh, and there was no funny business in the voting booth where they somehow switched uh, ballots. So as long as everything uh, was, are, was done correctly, then they will go ahead and tear that stub off retaining that stub till the end of the night, just so that we have another method by which to count should our numbers be off for some reason. And then you'll place that uh, application to vote face up on the spindle and remain 10 feet away from the um, tabulator as the voter puts their ballot into the um, tabulator. Now, one thing to keep in mind, because this ballot is only going to be eight and a half by 11, and with it being such a short ballot and um, the secrecy sleeves with the cutout, it could be a little bit hard for voters to slide their ballot uh, in the secrecy sleeve into the tabulator. What you can always instruct voters to do is take their ballot out of the secrecy sleeve and just kind of put it underneath it and slide their ballot in. Uh, that way they're still maintaining a sense of uh, secrecies, but they're uh, still uh, able to successfully tabulate their ballot if they're having problems using uh, the secrecy sleeve the way that it was designed. Uh, now we had a question about the difference between a provisional ballot and a challenge ballot. Um, so provisional ballots come in two forms. Uh, we have a provisional affidavit and we have a provisional envelope ballot. The provisional, uh, provisional process starts with them completing an uh, a voter registration form on the provisional envelope, which is basically us saying that we don't have them registered anywhere. And the provisional affidavit ballot is them saying that they have ballot photo identification, that they swear that they registered at least 14 days prior to the election, and we're just not finding them at all. In that case, that provisional affidavit ballot and the challenge ballot are just basically the exact same of we're preparing it with the piece of tape on the back and they're putting their ballot through just like normal. A provisional envelope ballot is they're registering with you in the precinct because they're saying, I don't have time to go to the clerk's office or I don't have the ability to go to the clerk's office with a provisional envelope ballot. I don't have a driver's license that shows my current address in the city. So I don't meet the photo identification requirement of an affidavit ballot. So their ballot's not going to go into the tabulator on election day. It's gonna go into an envelope. You're gonna bring that envelope back to city hall. And what that voter is gonna do is within the next six days after election day, they're gonna to have to bring us additional documentation that proves that they really do meet the requirements to vote. A challenge ballot, which we'll get more into challenge ballots, is just either the clerk's office or the state have challenged them because we're not really sure that they live at the address that they say they do because we've mailed them a confirmation card saying, hey, you know, their voter ID card came back undeliverable or an AV application came back undeliverable. So we got one piece of mail back as undeliverable. So we sent them a confirmation notice saying, we have reason to believe you don't live here. And then a second 
we sent them a confirmation notice saying, hey, we don't really believe you live here. And that came back undeliverable as well. So we put them as a challenge, like on challenge status, saying we truly don't believe that you live here because we've now gotten two pieces of mail back. Or in addition, it could be uh, that you have challengers in the precinct that are challenging voters based on having good reason to believe that they don't meet the qualifications to vote. So assisting voters, uh, there's three methods by which you can assist voters. Um, we have the voter assist terminal, which anybody can use. It doesn't need, it doesn't have to be a voter that looks like they need assistance or says that they need assistance. Anybody that wants to use the voter assist terminal can do so. Uh, secondly, uh, two election inspectors of opposite political parties can assist a voter in the voting booth. Uh, obviously, we would prefer if it's one uh, Republican and one Democratic election inspector. Um, if for some reason that's not possible during the course of the day, then um, we would prefer if it's uh, one Democrat and one minor political party, so one Green, one Libertarian, one um, you know working class member, if possible. Um, the third most preferable option in that case would be uh, two members of the same political party. But again, it always has to be two election inspectors that are assisting a voter. Uh, finally, anybody can assist the voter if they so choose. However, if the voter is choosing to have somebody assist them, there's uh, questions that you most must ask both the voter and uh, the individual assisting the voter. To the voter, you must ask, are you requesting assistance to vote by reason of blindness, disability, or inability to read or write? Again, as long as they answer yes, you'll ask a question of the inspector or of the person assisting them that says, are you the voter's employer, agent of that employer, or an officer or agent of the union to which that voter belongs? So again, um, the voter can have any um, you know, brother, cousin, sister, aunt, uncle, random person that they started chatting up in line be the person that assists them as long as that person is not uh, somebody that they work with or a member of their union. And um, in terms of why they're requesting assistance, it does have to be for reason of blindness, disability, or inability to read or write. That, that inability to read or write can be as simple as I left my glasses at home. So I'm going to struggle a little bit, or it could be, um, you know, English is a second language, so I'm going to struggle with the ballot. But what it can't be is I'm a first time voter and I'm not sure how to fill out my ballot. In terms of that, um, we have the sample ballot that you could show somebody like this is a ballot, these are your choices, you fill this in by completely darkening the uh, box. Uh, in terms of agent of an employer, so if you think of like a company and It's basically designed that I can't hire somebody to come interfere with my workers' right to vote. So if I have a direct influence on a voter, like 
uh, stake in voting. That's what it's designed to do. So an agent of the employer would be anybody that works for that company or has a tie to that employer. So it could be like a subcontractor or So issuing a ballot for use with the touch writer, um, you'll issue the voter a ballot in the e-poll book following normal procedures. Never make a remark that the voter uses the voter assist terminal. Uh, the reason for this simply is we have so uh, few individuals use the voter assist terminal. If we only had one and we indicated that they used the voter assist terminal, uh, then obviously that person would not have a secret ballot simply because it prints a ballot out for them. We would obviously know that that was that person's vote. So what you'll do is you'll record it just like they were uh, issued a regular ballot in the e-poll book. You record the ballot number and voter number on the application to vote, just like you would normally. You'll remove the ballot stub from the ballot and place just the stub in the clear uh, secrecy sleeve along with the application to vote. So you're not physically handing them the ballot. The ballot itself is going to get BAT written across it for voter assist terminal. And there's an envelope in which you'll place it in and that will get se uh, sealed and placed in your voted ballots at the end of the night. You're going to give the voter that secrecy sleeve containing the application to vote and the ballot stub, and then you'll walk with them to the voter assist terminal in which you'll prepare that for them to vote. There's a couple different ways to prepare the voter assist terminal. Uh, on the screen itself, it'll say ready for use, and you can touch that button, or on the back, it says poll worker, and you can press the poll worker button. Um, either way, it's going to take you to the same screen where it's going to ask you for the poll worker code, which will provide you on election day in your important document envelope. Once you enter that code, it's going to take you to the poll worker task menu where the top blue button will say activate a ballot. You'll select the correct precinct from the list. Once you confirm the selection, you'll go ahead and say activate the ballot. Once you've activated that ballot, the voter will get to a to get started touch here or turn the move wheel on the Verde access clockwise. Once they do either of those two actions, it's going to take them to a screen that asks them if they would like to use the accessibility features. They can either um, say yes, help me choose these features or skip no and go straight to voting. If they choose yes, you can uh, stick around and help them set up the accessibility features. Otherwise, uh, you'll wanna walk away and allow them to proceed to voting. If they choose yes, it'll give them three options, whether they want to just use audio only, whether they want to use both the screen and audio, or if they only want to use the screen. Uh, either way, through the choices that they make, it'll go ahead and proceed through uh, choosing or helping them choose their options. <clears throat> Once it's, they get done, they'll get to a screen of three pages worth of instructions on just how to use the machine itself. Or they can skip the instructions and they'll be taken to a about your ballot page. On their about their ballot page, they can either learn about their ballot or they can just click begin voting to begin voting their ballot. They can make choices on a few different ways. They can either uh, press their candidates on their screen to vote, vote for that. Uh, they can use the move wheel and green select button to make their choices. Uh, if they have an accessibility device, they can plug that in as well and make their choices using that. 
Um, they can use the next or skip to advance to contest on it. But once they've reached the end of the ballot, it'll take them to this review your ballot screen, the center photo there, where they can either select a specific contest if they wanted to go back and change their uh, decision, or if they go back to return to your ballot, it'll take them to the last contest on this um, screen. Or if they're happy with all their choices, they'll simply um, choose to hit print. It'll tell them that they can't make any changes after they've printed their ballot and ask them to confirm that they really want to print their ballot and they'll just say yes. Again, even though it's just an eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper, so we won't have to worry about that green uh, or gray extender tray for the printer this time, I will still print two side it because there are uh, ballot timing. So the barcodes on both sides of the uh, printers. So don't be alarmed and tell the voter not to be alarmed if it does uh, print and then suck back into the printer to print again uh, is a two-sided ballot. Uh, so campaigning, uh, individuals cannot post, display, or uh, distribute any election related material uh, within a hundred feet from any building entrance. Uh, keep in mind that the campaigning uh, does apply to both uh, this election as well as you can't gather petition signatures, whether it be for candidates or uh, future uh, referendum items within that 100 foot marker. It's typically what you see happen during off year elections uh, as individuals are uh, gathering signatures. Um, election inspectors, it's important that you um, know clothing or accessories with election information only tied to this election, which again, with it only being the four uh, charter amendments, I really don't think we're going to see anything directly tied to the ballot. Um, I think I've heard on Nextdoor that there may be some slogans about you know who got the bid and things like that so maybe we'll see something uh, but it's november so people can just quickly put their jacket on if there are any snarky uh or you know campaign driven uh shirts for this election uh, but keep in mind that uh, for this election, it would not directly apply to a uh, Make America Great hat or a Feel the Burn t-shirt because those individuals are not on the ballot. It's just the four charter amendments. Uh, exit polling, again, I highly doubt there's going to be any exit polling going on for this election uh, because it's just the four charter amendments, and I don't think the city's conducting any exit polling, but if it does, it has to be no closer than 20 feet from the exit, and they cannot enter the building. Uh, poll watchers, anybody can be a poll watcher. Um, they just have to be... Um, they're required to make remain in the uh, public area of the precinct and they cannot sit behind election inspectors. So really what I recommend you do is um, set your precinct up in a U shape so that way you can use the open uh, portion of the U as your public area. And that way they have a good place to observe without being in the way. Poll watchers are only able to observe the e-poll book at the discretion of the precinct and at times when doing so would not be disruptive to the operation of the precinct. Keep in mind, uh, photography in the precinct is limited to credentialed members of the press from the public area and voters taking a photo of their own ba uh, ballot in the voting booth. But keep it in mind again that they cannot appear in the photo along with their ballot. It's just a photo of their ballot. So challengers um, must be appointed by a political party or interest group. 
ahead of the election for this election. Um, I can let you know that promote the vote has been approved by the county clerk's office to appoint challengers for the November 2nd election. So it is possible that you will see challengers out there. Um, in addition, it's possible that the Republican and Democratic uh, political parties will be providing challengers on election day. Again, keep in mind that the Republican and Democratic uh, political parties don't have to tell us ahead of time if they'll have challengers out there. Um, only interest groups do. So we do know that the one interest group uh, will have uh, challengers. Um, keep in mind that no more than two per political party or organization can be present and actively challenging in a precinct. Um, challengers do have the ability to challenge your compliance on election law and then challenge a uh, voter's qualification to vote prior to the voter receiving their ballot. If they have good reason to believe the voter is not a resident of the city of Ann Arbor under the age of 18, not um, they, not a United States citizen or not registered to vote in the precinct. In terms of uh, credentials, uh, credentials are issued by the party, but they will list uh, the individual's name and also what uh, um, what precinct that they're uh, authorized to challenge in, and they'll be signed by somebody in the political party. So they'll be an official. Uh, document from the organization. In terms of promote the vote, uh, in your zippered notebook, we'll provide you with it. And that uh, email the night before, we'll provide you a copy of what promote the vote uh, credentials uh, look like. But anybody that is a challenger will have uh, a legal um, credential with them. Poll watchers don't have credentials. So your responsibility to challengers is provide them enough space to work, including behind the processing table. Uh, you can allow them examination of their voting equipment, but keep in mind they're not allowed to touch. If they do challenge a voter prior to the voter being issued a ballot, uh, you have to administer the oath to any voter that they challenge, which that oath is located in the um, Manual, you have to prepare challenge ballots and record the result of each challenge in the paper pull book. Uh, there's a page in there for challenge voters where you record the name of the voter, um, the reason for the challenge, and the result of the challenge. Again, preparing a challenge ballot is simple. You just write the number from the stub on the back somewhere in pencil and cover it with a piece of white post-it note tape. The voter tabulates their ballot just as they would normally. Uh, the reason that we do this is that way, if a judge ever rules that that voter really should not have been eligible to vote, uh, we have a way of going back through, finding that voter's ballot and subtracting it from the vote total. In my 16 years of doing this, I've never seen this actually happen. So again, challengers, they must carry credentials. They have to be registered voters in Michigan. They have the right to challenge a person's eligibility to vote. They have the right to challenge your actions. Um, as election inspectors, they can sit or stand behind you in the processor or processing table. Um, they have the right to look at the e-poll book. You know, poll watchers have none of those rights. Um, they can only look at the e-poll book when it wouldn't create a, de a delay. Neither of them can touch or handle any election material. 
Neither of them can use a video camera or recording device in the polling location. Both can use their cell phones, tablets, laptop, or other electronic device in the polling place. A lot of times what challengers are doing um, is doing get out the vote um, activity, less so this election, but with the parties um, in even your elections is they're making sure that uh, candidates or uh, individuals that they know are voting a particular way they make sure that they're actually voting. They can't wear clothing, buttons, et cetera, that identify the organizations which they represent. They can't set up tables. They're not allowed to question or approach and offer assistance to voters, but both are allowed to remain in the precinct until you complete all your work. And if they so wish, they're allowed to generate or to uh, obtain a copy of the results once the polls close. So, any other questions on challengers and poll watchers? I'm not quite sure where promote the vote is going to be. It's possible that they're more so focused on the absentee count board and the procedures there more so than the absent or than the precinct, which is kind of what I have a feeling may be the case is that they'll be in the absentee count board and seeing what the procedure is there. So closing the polls at 8 p.m., you must announce the polls are now closed. Anybody in line at that moment is permitted to vote. What I recommend that you do is if for some reason you do still have a line at 8 p.m., which I highly doubt, is that you hand applications to vote to all eligible voters in line at that time. Uh, only once the last voter has tabulated that their ballot can you begin the process of closing the polls. Please do not start knocking down voting booths while you still have people trying to vote. It's a very short ballot. I know it's a long day, but please do give them the decent seal of allowing them to vote their ballot in privacy and in seek or uh, privacy and in um, quiet. So that way they can, you know, be mindful of their decisions. And again, remember to keep the doors to the polling location unlocked during the entire closing process, because again, anybody interested in observing the right does have the right to do so. They don't have to be there at eight. They could pop in at 820 and see what's going on. After all the ballots have been processed, including any from the auxiliary compartment, confirm the tabulator shows the correct number of ballots processed. To do so, you'll compare the number of ballots tabulated to the e-poll book list of voters. Um, the numbers may be different only if you have any rejected or provisional envelope ballots. Remember, rejected and provisional envelope ballots don't get tabulated. But otherwise, those numbers should match. You'll want to make a note of the number of ballots tabulated according to your tabulator because you'll need these numbers as you're completing your ballot summary report in the e-poll book. Again, keep in mind that you'll want to break up uh, election inspectors into about three teams at the end of the night uh, so that each team can start to focus on uh, different parts of the closing process to make it uh, as expeditious as possible. One team focusing on uh, closing down the tabulator and the voter assist terminal. One team breaking down um, voting booths and taking down all the signs. And then one team focusing on the e-poll book. If for some reason your numbers don't match and it's not because of uh, the provisional envelopes and rejected ballots, then you'll wanna call our office immediately so that we can walk you through options. Closing the polls, 
in the electronic poll book, the first step to close the polls is to complete one final backup. Again, keep in mind that you'll be completing electronic uh, backups in your electronic poll books every 15 to 30 minutes. Uh, think of doing a backup in your electronic poll book as saving while writing a thesis. You would never want to save on page 400 of your thesis. You would want to save basically after every paragraph. So that way you wouldn't lose all of your brilliant work and have to start over from scratch. Um, there's a couple different ways you can uh, complete a backup. In the lower right hand corner of the screen, it'll flash back up overdue every 30 minutes, or you can click on that box whenever, and it'll take you to the screen where you can back up. Or in the upper left hand corner, you can click File Backup at any time, and it'll launch you into the little backup screen. Keeping in mind that after your first backup of the day, every um, backup after that will go ahead and tell you one already exists. Do you want to overwrite? You'll simply say yes to overwrite on top or to save over the old data with the newest data. Once it's done, um, you'll get a little backup finish successfully note. There are four items you have to save at the end of the night. Those four items are a ballot summary report, a list of voters, remarks, and a voter history. The first one is the only one that requires any real effort on your part, which is the ballot summary report. To complete the ballot summary report in the upper left-hand corner, you'll click reports, click ballot summary, Line A of the ballot summary report will already be filled in for you, which will be the total number of ballots issued. So that will be your starting and ending number of how many ballots we sent out to the precinct for you. Line B will automatically be set to zero as no absentee ballots are processed in the precinct. So line C will be the total number of ballots, uh, which you must account for at the end of the night. So how many ballots we have for you in the precinct. So there's nothing you have to do up in that top section, lines A through C. Line D, you'll take that number directly from the tabulator. So how many ballots were tabulated. Line E will again automatically show zero as absentee ballots are not processed in the precinct. Line F, the total number of ballots reissued to voters who spoil their ballots will automatically be calculated for you. Hopefully you won't have too many people spoiling their ballots as it's just a four question yes, no proposal. But if you have any ballots that are spoiled and reissued, this number will again be filled in for you. Line G, the total number of ballots rejected at the precinct is again automatically calculated for you. Keeping in mind that there's only three reasons a ballot is rejected because a ballot that is rejected is a voter that has lost their right to vote in that election. Those three reasons are one, the voter that intentionally exposes their ballot in the precinct. So they're basically campaigning in the precinct. So that's that person that's jumping up and down shouting, I voted for, I voted for, by God, I voted for. If prior to them putting their ballot in the tabulator, you can get that ballot from them. Again, because they've campaigned in the precinct, they've lost their right to vote in that election. That ballot would be rejected and you reject the ballot in the poll book. Uh, the second reason is when they get to the person 10 feet away from the tabulator, uh, the ballot stub does not match what we recorded on the application to vote and there's no uh, explanation on why those two numbers don't match. It wasn't just a clerical error on the person that wrote it down back at the e-poll book, or the ballot itself is just completely missing its stub and they have no idea what they did with the ballot stub. So therefore we can't guarantee that that really is the ballot that we issued them. So again, because we're not sure that that's really the ballot we gave them, we have to reject that ballot. 
Or lastly, which is the most common of the ones, is the voter that either uh, gets so frustrated with the process or so angry with the process that they just walk away without tabulating their ballot. And then in that case, you would also reject those ballots that don't get placed into the tabulator. So those are the only three reasons you would reject a ballot. <clears throat> Line H is the number of ballots used for duplication. 99.99% of the time, this number is going to be zero, but you're going to have to physically enter a zero in line H. Keeping in mind uh, that the only time you would duplicate a ballot is basically the perfect storm of your tabulator breaks on election day. So you have to have uh, individuals start to use the auxiliary bin. In addition to that issue of your tabulator breaking on election day, when you finally go to start putting those ballots through that were in the auxiliary bin, there's one that has a rip in it or some other uh, defect on the ballot itself that prevents the ballot from going through the tabulator. That in that case, two election inspectors of opposite political parties would go through and have to recreate that ballot on a new ballot that would allow it to go through the tabulator. That would be the only time you would have to duplicate a ballot in the precinct which is again why it's extremely rare. Uh, line I is the total number of provisional envelope ballots. Again, that's automatically calculated for you because as you issue a provisional envelope, uh, you mark it as provisional envelope in e-poll book. So it knows to subtract that from your tabulator count. Line J will be filled in for you in the morning like you've issued zero ballots. So your starting number will be whatever your first ballot that you issued of the day is. And your ending number will be the last ballot in your ballot packs. So what you'll do is you'll just change just the starting number to whatever the next ballot number you would issue to. So you'll just look at that stack of ballots next to the e poll book is. And whatever that top ballot number is, that will be your new starting number. Please don't touch the ending number. Uh, it's already filled in for you. Once you adjust that starting number, you can click in any of the white boxes above and it'll automatically do the math for you and you're looking for line L to be zero. You may have to scroll down a little bit on the right hand side to see line L, but once you get to line L, to be zero, you'll click preview at the bottom of the screen. Once you click preview, it's gonna open up the ballot summary report preview and you'll click the little floppy disk in the upper left-hand corner of the screen and you'll see PDF. Once you click the little PDF button, it's gonna to default to saving to that uh, floppy, uh, floppy uh, USB drive, which is exactly what you wanted to do and you'll just save it. Once you save, uh, you'll get a little uh, pop-up that says uh, ballot summary has been exported to you know, USB drive. You'll click OK. You'll close out of the report preview by either clicking close or the red X in the upper right-hand corner. Uh, you'll close out of this ballot Summary report, again, by either kicking close or the red X in the upper right-hand corner. And then you can move on to saving your next report, which is your list of voters report. To do so, again, from the main screen in the e-poll book, you'll click reports in the upper left-hand corner, and you'll click list of voters. Once it generates, again, you'll just click that uh, floppy disk icon in the upper left-hand corner of the screen. It'll again say PDF. This time when you go to save it, you'll see that your ballot summary is already there. So it'll kind of give you added confirmation that you're going to the right place in the USB drive. But again, you'll just say save. You'll get a little message saying that it's been exported to RPT voter list. You'll set a okay and you'll close out using either the close or the X in the upper right hand corner. From there, you'll go to the remarks page. 
So again, clicking reports in the upper left-hand corner and then going to remarks. It'll pop up a uh, remarks page. One thing to note about the remarks page is if you've not made any remarks during the course of the day, um, it will not save that blank PDF. So you, we do ask because we do look for this and it is a requirement that we save or send a copy of this down to Washtenaw County. Uh, so if you have not made any remarks during the course of the day, we ask that you close this out and just go back to the home page where you'll see general remarks and just make a general remark that says something as simple as have a good night, all's well that ends well, something simple like that. So that way you can save this. And it also saves us uh, the trouble of going, having to pull your laptop back out, uh, opening it up just to see were there any remarks that just happened to not get saved. But if you do have remarks already, then you'll just simply save it by clicking that little PDF icon or clicking the little floppy disk icon, clicking PDF, again, saving to your flash drive. A little export it to RPT remarks will pop up, click OK, and then you can close. Now, the final file, which is the one that causes a little, uh, the greatest amount of issues is the voter history file. And this is the most important file of all because this is what we use to go through and update um, everybody's voter records afterwards, indicating whether or not you vote it. This one is under file and you just go to file, save history. Again, it will default to saving on your floppy there uh, or on your flash drive. Don't be concerned when you don't see any other items on your flash drive. The reason being, this is a CSV file as opposed to the other files that you just saved that were PDFs. As long as you see that you're saving on that USB drive, you're good to just hit save. You'll get a little message saying history data has been saved successfully and you'll just click OK. To do a double check to make sure that you have all five files that we need saved on your flash drive, you'll go ahead and click the little Windows icon, which is that four panel little icon in the lower left-hand corner of the screen. Once you click on that, there'll be a piece of paper icon that's documents that you'll click on. That'll open up a browser where you can double click on USB drive and you'll be looking to verify that there are five files. Those five files, will be RPT ballot summary, your epb.accdb, which is your backups throughout the course of the day, your epb underscore history.csv, your RPT voter list, your RPT remarks. So as long as you have those five files, you're good to go ahead and shut the computer down. To shut the computer down, you'll again hit that Windows icon in the lower left-hand corner, and then the one icon up, You'll click that button and it'll say shut down. Once the computer is fully shut down, you can go ahead and then remove the flash drive and place it in the blue um, transfer bag, small transfer bag, which you'll also place the memory cards from the voter assist terminal and the tabulator for transport back to City Hall. So closing the tabulator, you'll wanna unspool the thermal tape that was safely tucked away in the morning, making sure you pull it past the last line of signatures so you don't print over everything you did in the morning. Once you unspool that tape, you'll press the lid back down and the printer will go from orange to green, letting you know it's good to print again. From the back of the tabulator, you'll press the little blue poll worker button and you'll enter your poll worker code. You'll press close polls. The tabulator will ask you to confirm that you really wanna close the polls. Say yes, close the polls. You'll enter your closed polls code. Again, this password will be located in your important document envelope. What's going to happen is it's going to print one copy of your total state. After that first copy of your totals tape is done printing, which again will be very quickly since it's just the four races, 
Once it's done printing the first copy, it's going to try to go ahead and transmit your results down to Washtenaw County via secure modem. It's automatically going to try to do this. If it goes through, it's automatically going to uh, transmit or it's automatically going to generate a, a transmission status report that says it was successful. If for some reason it fails, the screen is going to come up, up and say transmission failed and ask you if you want to retry or cancel. If it fails, we do ask that you retry one time and one time only. And if it still fails on that second time, then you can go ahead and hit cancel. All this step in the process is doing is sending the results down to Washtenaw County so that they can upload them onto their uh, website uh, instantaneously. Um, it's not that big of a deal if it fails because all the results from the election are still uh, maintained securely on that USB drive with inside the machine that you cut out once it's closed. So it just means that uh, Washtenaw County is just a little bit delayed in getting the results if it fails, which is why we don't worry uh, more than the one time if it uh, does not go through. And we're not asking you to like run it out to the parking lot to try to uh, have a transmission go through. So if you do have uh, two failures of transmission, you'll simply hit cancel. It'll still print out a status report showing that it failed. And then your two more copies of your totals tapes will print after that. Once that third copy of your totals tape uh, is done printing, then you can go ahead. It'll come up with a screen that says the polls are closed. That will be your cue that you can go ahead and tear those tapes off and all the election inspectors present will sign in the four places on the tape. That will also be your cue that you can go ahead and press the power button on the back of the tabulator to go ahead and shut down the tabulator. Once it's fully shut down, that's when you can go ahead and proceed. Get ahead of myself. <clears throat> so depositing ballots at the end of the night, um, as it goes through and powers off, uh, you can go ahead and gather up all the voted ballots from the bottom of the ballot box, and you'll place all your voted ballots into a um, blue ballot bag. In addition to all your voted ballots, you'll place any spoiled or defective ballots in there. Any ballots that were duplicated would be sealed in your original ballot envelope and placed in there. Your surrendered absentee ballot envelope and your voter ballot envelope, all those would be placed in there. Uh, you'll have a separate, separate uh, ballot bag for all your unvoted ballots. Again, your unvoted ballots do not need to come back to City Hall. You can place them back in. Once you seal the bag, you'll place that bag back in the black ballot box. I uh, know we no longer post the polling, uh, the results at the polling place, because again, uh, with the results being transmitted directly to Washtenaw County, uh, we're breaking people of the habit of coming to the precinct because they can just go online and get them. So no, we're no longer posting results in the precinct. Keep in mind, if you do have any provisional uh, provisional ballots, those do not get sealed in the uh, ballot bag. Those are the only ballots not sealed up at the end of the night. Those need to be returned separately to the clerk's office. So sealing ballot containers in the front pocket of your zippered notebook, you'll find uh, two plastic sleeves, one containing a blue card for your voted ballots, and one containing a white card for your unvoted ballots. Each of these two plastic sleeves will have two blue, two blue pull tight seals in them. Um, you only need one seal for each set of, or each ballot bag. Uh, we just give you a second one in case of emergency, should you have to cut it for some reason because you sealed something prematurely or you need to reseal it because you used the wrong opening. 
on the ballot bag. So this is why we give you an extra one. But you'll complete both cards with the seal number that was used to seal the bag and a Republican and a Democrat that's responsible for verifying the seal. Uh, on the blue card as well, you'll indicate the total number of ballots that are in the ballot bag. So the total number is from the tabulator, how many voted ballots are in that bag. You'll place the cards back in their pouches and use one blue pull tight seal again with the ballot bags to make sure that they're fully sealed and cannot be tampered with. It's important that the uh, zippers come all the way together and that you're only using uh, the grommet in between the two zippers to seal up that uh, ballot bag. <clears throat> so closing the touch writer, uh, you'll press the blue pull worker button on the back to access the main menu. Uh, one difference will be uh, once you go to close the touch writer, um, it's not automatically gonna say, uh, close polls because it's expecting you to do other actions throughout the course of the day rather than just open and close it. So you'll have to hit menu from the top of the screen to be able to access closed polls. But again, once you uh, do get to the closed polls, it'll just ask you to close, enter the closed polls code, which will be in your important document envelope. It's going to print a short uh, closed polls code or closed polls report, which you'll just sign and place in your local clerk receiving board envelope. Once it's done printing that report, you can press the red power button to power down the touch writer. Once both devices are fully powered down, so they have a black screen on both of them, you can use a pair of wire cutters or scissors located in uh, the pencil case in your zipper notebook to remove the blue pull tight seals covering the memory device lids on both uh, devices. Using the black key, unlock the lid covering the USB drive, and then gently remove the USB drives from both. And again, uh, those will be sealed in that blue memory card transfer along with the flash drive from your e whole book. Inside that uh, container, will be a plastic pouch containing a green card stock and two seals. Again, that seal number will be recorded. That's going to be used to seal the bag and a Republican and a Democrat will go ahead and seal that. In the paper poll book itself, um, the certificate of election inspector form will need to be completed in ink. The top line will be so this line here will be the total number of votes according to the tabulator. The bottom line will be the total number of votes or third line down will be the total number of votes. Um, according to the list of voters, so your e-poll book, you'll go through and check off all the check marks. In, Section two, seal verification. Uh, the first seal number that you'll record is the seal from your voted ballots. So the line that says, if ballot container requires two seals, you'll record the seal number of your unvoted ballot bag. Your memory card transfer bag is that small blue ballot bag or small blue memory card bag that has your three USBs in it. A Democrat and a Republican will sign. And then everybody, including those two election inspectors that signed above, will sign down in section three. Now, in the two local clerk receiving board envelope, you'll place the following items your poll book, don't detach any of the forms, your zero tape with the three totals tapes attached, signed by all election inspectors. Again, don't cut off any of the tapes, that'll be done for you at the receiving board. Your opening checkoff list, which is uh, the form that's designed to help you opening up your polls by telling you exactly what needs to be done and if you need any assistance, what page to turn to in the election inspector manual. Your voter ID affidavit tally sheet, which just is a sheet that we have for you so you can keep track of how many people did not have photo ID during the course of the day. Uh, your problem sheets was another sheet to record any issues that you have during the course of the day. 
your notes to Jackie, Jennifer, and myself, which is a place for you to record any uh, questions, concerns, or suggestions for improvement. Your precinct reconciliation form, which is uh, a form where every two hours you can go through and check to make sure you're on track for a good uh, closing by making sure your numbers match up. Any completed voter registration applications, while you don't process voter registration applications in the precinct, there are times where a voter may have to complete a voter registration prior to voting. So voters that need to sign a registration or uh, need to fill out whether or not they're a United States citizen uh, will have to complete that voter registration application. Uh, complete Provisional ballot forms would be returned in the local clerk receiving board envelope. Your completed flow charts, your applications to vote on the spindle will go in there. The affidavit of absent voter. So remember in your uh, forms, you'll have an affidavit for any uh, voter that received an absentee voter ballot that decided not to vote their absentee ballot that arrived to the precinct without their absentee ballot. Remember, you have to call our office prior to allowing them to vote to make sure that they did not turn that ballot in since the e-poll book was loaded at 4 p.m. on Monday. And then they'll also have to sign that affidavit saying that they either never received their ballot or they lost or destroyed their ballot. And destroying their ballot could be as simple as it's sitting at home on the kitchen table and they're gonna throw it away when they get home. Uh, your time sheets, as well as your closing checkoff list, which again helps you close at the end of the night. Delivering of documents, one Democrat and one Republican election inspector doesn't necessarily have to be your chairperson. We'll deliver the following documents to City Hall. Your sealed local clerk receiving board envelope. Your zippered notebook with keys to the tabulator and the room slash building if applicable. Your sealed small blue vinyl pouch containing the flash drives from the e-poll book, the tabulator, and the voter assist terminal. And your sealed large blue vinyl canvas ballot bag containing only your voted ballots and your e-poll book laptops. Any other questions for this training? Otherwise, I thank everybody for coming out to training this morning, and I look forward to seeing everybody on November 2nd, and you should have already received your appointment emails, and you should look forward to my email on the 1st with any last minute details, and I'll see everybody on election day. Take care.